most players are doing very little in my experience. And whenever you put all your knowledge onto a, let's say onto a page, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of knowledge over those years. Trying to simplify what can be complex subjects was challenging, but the biggest um, overarching agenda that we had was how do we make this applicable? How can you use all of this knowledge and theory and, and, and academic research but apply it to a 14-year-old girl in Kansas or a 22-year-old young professional in Michigan or whoever it is? Welcome to the Cutting Edge Coaching Podcast, where we believe coaches are some of the most important teachers and leaders in the world, and they deserve to be supported. I'm your host, Luke Gromer, and every week we're bringing you conversations with coaches, experts, and leaders from across sports that will give you practical ideas and strategies that you can apply in your coaching to develop high-performing teams and high-character people. Coaches, I'm excited to welcome Paul McVeigh to the podcast. Paul is a sport and performance psychologist and a former English Premier League footballer which you'll hear more about in this episode. In this conversation, we talk about the power of belief, a simple framework for mental performance, identity and performance, and emotional regulation. If you enjoyed this episode and want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, just go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast, or click the link in the show details to download a free PDF of notes from this episode or any episode. And coaches, we just wrapped up the first annual summer coaching series. And you can still get access to all the video replays, audio-only replays, coaching notes, and more from all 12 sessions at summercoachingseries.com. You can also check out the incredible lineup of guests we had and hear what coaches had to say about their experience. Just go to summercoachingseries.com to learn more or get access. And one note about this conversation before we hop in. It was recorded live at a coaching convention, so there may be a bit of background noise at times, but we did our best to edit the audio to bring you the highest quality possible. Now to my conversation with Paul McVeigh. Enjoy the episode. Coaches, really excited to welcome Paul McVeigh to the podcast. Uh, Paul, first of all, thanks for joining me. And I would love it if you just started by uh, sharing just a few bullet points about your journey as a player and then uh, transition into uh, sport performance psychology. Okay, Luke, well, thanks for having me. And, and that's, a, that's a very, very tough ask to be able to try and bullet point it in, in, a, in a few seconds. Uh, oh, really, really high level is left Ireland as a 16-year-old kid when joined Tottenham Hotspur on the same day that Jurgen Klinsmann was signed as his first day at Tottenham Hotspur. I'm sure he doesn't remember me, but I remember him. And then had six years there and had a, a few appearances in the, in the English Premier League, playing up front with the likes of Teddy Sheringham and Saul Campbell, etc. in that Spurs debut team. But Realizing I wasn't really at that level to play Premier League for kind of the rest of my career. So I found my level at Norwich City, which was, which was such an amazing club, and managed to get promoted when the championship, get promoted back into the Premier League again, and had another crack at the Premier League playing against the likes of Ronaldo at Man United first time round, Thierry Henry and that Invincibles team that we played against, and et cetera. But again, just knowing that that was not my level and to... to too hard to compete with the best players in the world. So back into the, the championship again and then decided to stop playing in 2010. And, and it was a conscious choice for me. We won the league second time around. I had a second spell at Norwich under Paul Lambert. And we won the league. And I was 32 and I realized I was, you know, fit and healthy. Kind of had done everything I wanted to do in professional football and decided to walk away because I, I really had a passion and enthusiasm for this whole subject of psychology and mental performance. and the last 10, 12 years, I've been working as a sports psychologist with a couple of EPL teams, Palace and Norwich. And also, mostly, the majority of the work I do is in the corporate world, speaking, developing, performance development for senior leaders and teams with yeah, some, some big organizations like Microsoft, Cisco, PwC, uh, Barclays. Yeah, it's just re- really, really fortunate. And, and again, back in Kansas from a second appearance at the USC convention. So that probably was not a couple of bullet points, but no, it's perfect. It was great. <laughs> it's interesting to hear about that journey. And I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, 
the transition from player to studying um, sports psychology and becoming a sports psychologist. I, I'm really curious when you walked away from playing, why did you decide to go study that and then ultimately do that work? Was that something that you were interested in as a player? Was it something that when you finished playing, you realized, wow, this was a huge gap in my game. I want to help others. What was that like? Why did you do it? Well, it was actually the opposite. I was, I had come across this world of, of, and again, it depends really what term and how you coin it. Is, is it psychology? Is it mental performance? Is it uh, self-help, personal development? You know, I suppose they all have different connotations. But all I know is I left Belfast at 16 in 1994 and I had an inferiority complex that I just didn't think it was good enough, whether it's because, you know, I'm a little short arse, only, you know, four foot nothing, or whether it's my Irish accent around loads of English guys and, and realized that, when I read this book, which completely changed my life and it just made me think about the possibility of I can take control of my life, I can decide where I end up, I have more control over my destiny as opposed to life happens and that's where we go. So once I started embracing that I needed to educate myself and if there's a four-corner model of, of performance of the technical, physical, psychological and social, I realized that the psychological area for me had the biggest opportunity for me to improve what I was doing. Did you say you read a book that was this light bulb moment? What book was it? It was called Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins, big uh, personal development guru in America. And it, it just, it was like taking the blinkers off me that I did not realize I even had. But again, that's back to, you know, the whole, the whole subject of psychology is to do with awareness. Are you aware of the way that you're, habitual thought patterns pretty much dictate your life. And so even the process of sharing how humans function, whether it's in a sporting context, whether it's in a corporate setting, people probably don't realize just how important the way we think, how we think, the meaning we give things, our belief systems, our, our entire world is dictated by our thoughts and ultimately that drives what our life looks like. So if you're happy with your life, it's because of your mindset and psychology that you're happy with it. If you're not happy with your life, it's to do with your psychology, your mindset. And yet a lot of people put external factors into that equation. And that's a very, very different subject. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think that segues well into talking about what you presented on today. Mm -hmm. uh, your session was titled The Power of Belief. And so let's just talk about that more. and you know, how this applies to us as coaches and then ultimately to the athletes that we're coaching and leading. Uh, tell me about what you talked about in that session, the power of belief. How powerful is it? What do we need to be uh, considering with our mindset and our beliefs? Well, the first question I asked today was, what is a belief? So what, what would your take on that answer? If I asked that question, what is a belief for you? Something you hold to be true something that you uh truth and reality i think are, are kind of this, this cycle right here absolutely right? so it's Amazing. truth is what you think corresponds to reality and reality is what corresponds to truth it's your truth which is probably more important and, yeah and that's the operative word and and it, it's like you're in the session i know you weren't because you've been doing this all day with you but you have a definition that we use that hopefully simplifies what a belief is and it's just something that you accept as true or real now Everybody has a very, very different reality and everybody has a very different acceptance of, of what is true. But essentially, everybody who came to the session today all walk in with a completely different set of beliefs. And yet, the majority of the people in the world are going around interacting with whether it's people, situations, organizations, and they all have beliefs that this is right and this is wrong. This is good and this is bad. This is acceptable and this is unacceptable based on their version of what's true or real. And of course, it's not what is true or real, it's just what they accept is true or real. So you can apply that into the sporting context and then you'd say, okay, so how you should, I don't know, prepare for a game, how you should respond when something goes wrong, how you should deal with a coach who's giving you criticism or feedback. All of these different things are all just based on what your experience is and what people may tell you. And again, then it's back to, you know, how do you form a belief? What are all the different things, how that impacts you? 
I suppose the, the probably to sum up the entire session, it's whatever you believe, whatever you think is true or real, it's just normal for you. So really, really quick, say financial example. It could be someone, guy or girl, who just walked past us or lives half a mile down the road and they think it's perfectly normal to go and earn $40,000 this year for their total salary, $40,000, $50,000. And half a mile in the other direction, there might be another guy or girl who just think it's normal, completely acceptable, this is just the way it's always been, that they're going to earn $4 million this year or $5 million. But it's their normal. So really what my question is, does your normal allow you to have the life that you want to have, aspire to have, have ever thought about having? Yeah, that's a really challenging question, a good question. And so connected to, like, you know, the expectations that we have for ourselves, other people, our circumstances. One of the things that my mind is going to now is just from the coaching standpoint, we often formulate a ton of beliefs about our players. And Paul did X, Y, Z in practice. So I believe this about him. Generally with limited information as well. Yeah. And I think that can be really dangerous and damaging to the way we lead, the environment we create, so many factors there. But just be curious from your perspective and your work, you know, as coaches, how do we, how do we avoid doing that? Like, how do we avoid forming a bunch of beliefs about our team, our players that are limiting or, or hurtful? to them, their culture, our coaching? Well, one of the, um, the ways that I was suggesting today that how you can improve you know, your self-belief or your self-worth or whatever it is, and the first step, it's back to the awareness. It's, it's unless you're aware of some of the beliefs that you're placing, and all coaches will place their beliefs on their players because it's down to their experience of what they think. You know what I said a few minutes ago? This is right and this is wrong. This is good and this bad. This is acceptable and this is unacceptable according to their experience of life and how much is that compared to the bigger picture of the knowledge in the world and what elite performance looks like. And they'll have one version of what that should be like and they'll place that under their players. And so I suppose it goes back to my reason why I started reading that book when I was 17 and then I've continued to try and educate myself is, is just a, a curiosity of improving and, and I think it comes from the medical profession of a, a lifelong learning. If you can have a mindset or a philosophy that or even a belief, because you can decide to create this belief for yourself, that you want to continually learn and improve as you go through your life, then that's uh I think that's a great place to be. Because then you and the player are on the journey together rather than you're at the end. And you're telling the player and just regurgitating all the advice and experience that you've had over the years, which of course is not a good way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That self-awareness piece is so, so important for, I mean, so many aspects of life and our coaching. I'm curious though, as, as we think about, you know, coaches as leaders and the athletes that we're leading and coaching like we mentioned, you know, it's really easy for them to develop these beliefs about themselves or about the coach, you know, whatever it may be, wherever these beliefs are going. I guess my question here is, you know, how, how do we help our athletes maybe recognize and break away from some of those beliefs that are holding that might not be serving them, might be holding them back? I think it, it starts to land itself then to meaning we give things. So a lot of the work that I did in the, uh, in the, in the Premier League with, with top players, top international players who are playing at the top of their game in the most competitive and you know, probably the richest league in the world. And the number one reason why they would come and see me is because of their confidence. And their confidence would inextricably linked to the performance they've just had. And it's kind of crazy because you're thinking, well, you're already at the top of your game, you know. <laughs> why are you allowing yourself that if you've had a bad game, why would you beat yourself up over it? Why are you in a bad mood? Why are you giving yourself a hard time? Because let's be honest, there's enough people trying to kick them all over the field <laughs> on the opposite side. 
that why are they doing it mentally, internally to themselves? And it's like, you probably wouldn't speak to your worst enemy the way you speak to yourself. So again, back to how can I give a meaning to what happens, whether it's on the field, off the field, so that I can keep progressing, I can keep improving, and I can make the most out of the limited potential we have. Because let's be honest, we all have our limitations. So, you know, this is very hard to <laughs> tell this joke over a, over a podcast, but, you know, I, I'm only five foot six. So I was always the smallest player in our team. So I'm thinking, well, like I actually played with Peter Crouch. Peter Crouch was in the youth team the year below me. And I'm thinking, well, he's six foot seven. I'm five foot six. There's, there's no way I'm ever going to be able to compete with him physically and all of the, the top athletes I played with and against. So that's, that's just the way it is. Nothing I can do. Technically, I was okay. I was never the best. You know, I played with lots of amazing players and I was nowhere near that level. So it was somewhere in the middle. And then I just thought, well, psychologically is, is probably the, it's probably, you know, I think 20 years later, you could probably call it like the last frontier of performance. Everything else has been done to within an inch of its life. You're not really going to learn how to improve any more technically. You know, everybody can do everything with a ball. Physically, these athletes are supreme in every sense. But the psychology is still right at the bottom of the list. It's still right at the greatest opportunity for growth at every player, at every level of the game. So it's interesting, the program that we've just created called Get Psyched Up. They say, well, how is it geared? Who's it geared towards? What age group? I'm going, in my experience, most coaches, most players, if we're talking about that four-corner model, how much time are you spending on the left side, technical, physical, 95, 98, 99, 100% of the time? How much are you spending on the psychological? Let's say very little or... Showed them a video. Or not at all. Yeah. And if you were to ask people, so what's probably the greatest impact or performance? probably most people's attitude, psychology, or mindset. And how much are you doing to improve that? Not a lot. Well, I think whether it's our program, whether it's Dan Abraham's program, whether it's working with a sports psychologist, a coach, a mentor, whoever it is, just improve in that area. For me, every single player in the world should be doing that. And every coach should be encouraging them. Yeah. And the coach probably needs to be doing it themselves. And the coach needs to do it themselves because they're going to have limitations on what they think they're capable of. And back to the, the financial example I give, whether that coach thinks they're a high school coach or a college coach or a professional coach, yeah. and even if they're a professional coach, are they a bottom of the ta- ta- table yeah. coach or are they a title winning coach, championship winning coach? So you just see how this is rife and we're constantly changing, constantly evolving. But most people are not progressing around the psychology. There'll be a natural improvement because it's, you just naturally will learn through possibly reflecting on certain experiences you've had. But I'm saying the difference between that and consciously dedicating time to improve this area of your performance, your player's performance, I think has got the greatest potential. Two follow-up questions. First, well, the second thing I want to talk about is I want to dig into that framework a little bit that you talked about. But before that, for the youth coach, high school coach who they don't have the budget or means yeah. to hire a sports psychologist yeah. to come work with their team. They might not even have the means to get a curriculum to deploy with their team. Uh, no excuse, by the way, but go on. Sure. Well, I'll let no, you exactly. see where you go on the answer. But like, what are some ways, some practical things that any coach can do, can integrate into their coaching, their leading, their team to build the mindsets, the mental performance, the psychology of their athletes? So I would say that you don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to work with a psychologist. You don't have to go on a psychology course or program. You don't have to do what I did and go and do my master's in psychology to go and learn about the theory and the academia and the tenets of performance and all that fun stuff, really riveting fun stuff. But if you, ha- if you, have, a f- if you have a phone in your pocket, if you have a phone in your pocket... If you have a phone in your pocket or a computer or a laptop, you can search online and you can learn everything you possibly ever want or need to know about psychology and mental performance on Google. So there's probably not an excuse in terms of budgets. It's more the desire to improve what you do. Yeah, I, I 
totally agree with you there. You know, it's such an amazing just time that we live in where information is so accessible uh, to everybody about so a- many topics. Any subject. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable the things that you can learn if you're willing to dedicate some time and you're a little bit curious about it. But let's dive into this framework that uh, you're also going to be presenting on. You talked about this mental performance framework. Just walk us through it. What is it? What, what's in this framework that's essential for athletes and coaches? Yeah, I, I have for, well, 10 years since I stopped playing professionally, I've been able to very fortunately work with some top performers, whether it's in the Premier League, in the first team, whether it's the academy players coming through. It doesn't really matter the level, but the way that I could do it, the only way that I could do it for the last 10 years was face-to-face in a room or on a field with these players. And then, of course, you know, COVID and all of the issues we've had over the last couple of years. And suddenly, everybody's used to e-learning. Everybody's used to digital platforms. Everyone's used to virtual delivery. And then I thought, well, me and my business partner, who's actually a, a former rugby international. So in terms of my career, having played a couple of games in the top flight in England, my friend, business partner, Leon Lloyd, won six premiership titles with his rugby team won two European Cups, scored the winning try in a European Cup final, which was the level of his performance. So between the two of us, you know, we've had nearly 50 years of experience of elite performance. And so we decided to share our framework, our lessons, our insights, our knowledge, and of course, my background of the sports psychology and the academia, and put it into a framework that you can simply apply to any player at any level. Because I think I just alluded to it, that most players are doing very little in my experience. And whenever you put all your knowledge onto a, let's say, onto a page, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of knowledge over those years. Trying to simplify what can be complex subjects was challenging. But the biggest um, overarching agenda that we had was how do we make this applicable? How can you use all of this knowledge and theory and, and, and academic research but apply it to a 14-year-old girl in Kansas or a 22-year-old young professional in Michigan or whoever it is. So one of the big things was being able to give them almost like a toolkit so that they can apply the different subject matters. And the reason why it's called Get Psyched Up is the psychs, the acronym, so P's for performance, S around statistics, because again, just even starting to analyze your own performance, no matter what level, is going to improve because then you're not subjective. You know, after a match, how did you do? Parents or friends ask, how did you do? And it's normally, what was the score? Who scored? How did you play? You know, it's so, it's so vague, so generic. And then if it was, how did you play? There's normally probably three answers to that. Oh, I did okay. Or if you played really, really well, best game of your life, it was like, yeah, it did, did well. Or if you had an absolute terrible game, you're like, oh, disgusting. But again, three generic answers did not give you any way to learn. So all... Everything we're trying to do is how do you keep learning from all these experiences? So then that's why the statistics, then it goes into why and you, and that's where it comes away from our elite performance background. So I would say probably 70, 80% of the course is around elite performance, but then 20, 30 of it was probably based around just mental well-being, mental health, because I even saw a statistic recently that in England, 97% of the scholars that join Premier League academies, 97% that join at 16, never go on to play professionally. 97% of the best players in the country who managed to join the Man United's, the Liverpool's, 97% of them never go and play a first team game. Which essentially is for me saying that the program that we created can't be just about elite performance. It's got to be about helping them in life. So, you know, we create things like wellness journals and gratitude journals, et cetera. And, then we start going through things like, you know, confidence, just bad self, that whole, that whole subject of confidence. As I said, it's the number one reason why players came and spoke to me. Then we talk about the habits that players create. And again, loads of habits that are helpful, but also can hinder you. Um, probably the biggest aspect of, of sport, and especially elite sport, and the higher you go, the harder it is to do it. But it's managing your emotions. So the emotional side of it is, is key and critical. And that's what I'll be doing tomorrow talking about that. And then the last one is, is developing relationships because yes, they will help you on the field, but more importantly, off the field. And, and if I were to sum up my 
kind of nearly 20 year career of playing, all of the best moments happened off the field. It's just because it's where we are. We're people. We, we need other people. We love people. I especially love being around other people and having that interaction because we're an interdependent species and we get our energy from other people as well. So again, equally as important to not just help them with the elite side of performance, but also help them in terms of just improving as people. That's so good. I, I really like that framework. And there's a couple of those pieces I want to just dive a little bit more into and get your thoughts on. The, the first is the, the mental well-being and mental health. And you talked about that statistic from just the amount of, you know, athletes who have these aspirations and, and get think about in. they're the best of the best. Yeah, and they don't know, make it. And they don't, and they don't even get close to making it. Yeah, yeah. And how, like, navigating that, you know, just to put yourself in that shoes, man, what would that feel like? How do you move on from that? And then also, you know, just in that environment, in, in any sporting environment, it's a performance environment. Like, you know, even at the youth levels where hopefully the emphasis is on fun and enjoyment and making sure these kids have an incredible experience, they're still trying to perform. And there's just pressure that comes with that. And, and I want to talk about emotion a little bit later. But how, how yeah, what, what do we need to do or what, what tools do we need to give our athletes to help them be more mentally healthy, right? To improve their mental well-being. Such a massive, massive question, difficult question to answer, hugely important question to at least try and start answering it. But I would say that one of the best decisions, one of the biggest decisions ever made whenever I was younger was how do I stop having my job as my identity in life? And whenever you become, whether it's an athlete, whether it's soccer, baseball, basketball, whatever it is, and even just going through the college system in, in the States, straight away, you're the one in your town or your city or state and everybody knows you and people talk, oh, there's the guy or girl who does that. They're the one who does the, you know, whatever it is your sport is. And it's amazing because it's almost being forced onto you through society and life experiences. And so the hardest part is to not accept that, that you are just that, what you do. So I don't know why I did this, but from 21, I don't remember this very well. When I was 21, I made a decision that I was not just a footballer. And actually the book that I wrote was called The Super Footballer is Dead because I just hated the fact that people had a certain preconception of what footballers were like or athletes in my sport were like. And I thought, well, I'm not stupid. I'm not the brightest person in the room, but I'm definitely not stupid. So why does everybody think just because I can kick a ball around at a certain level that I'm stupid? So having that differentiation away from what you do and who you are is the best starting point. But unfortunately, lots of people fall into that trap, especially from an early age. And I'll talk about in English. The English culture of, you know, if a seven or eight year old, if their parents get asked to come and join, let's say Manchester United Academy, and suddenly they turn up with their Manchester United, you know, tracksuit and leisure wear and have that badge, they're they're like a prop. They feel in their head they're a proper first team Man United. But I'm like, well, this is it. This is the way my life's going. So it's it's obviously as we just saw the stats. It's just it's highly unlikely that's going to happen. But because they're kind of placed in that environment it's very very difficult to extract yourself from it that's such a, a good point and so important you know you had that moment as an athlete so important for us though as coaches too like our identity can't just be as a coach and we can't tie our identity to the performance of this team that we're coaching and these athletes regardless of what level like if your identity is totally tied to their performance you're just gonna be miserable and then too like when it's over, and I'm sure that you, you probably know tons of athletes that when their career ended, like their life was in shambles probably because their, whole, ident their whole identity was as a, a, an athlete, right? And now all of a sudden that's done. It's gone. 
what do you do? Right. And you said, you know, I had this moment where I decided I'm, I'm more than a, I'm more than a soccer player, I'm more than a footballer. Um, who, who am I? I'm sure you had to go on that journey, but not everyone does. And mm-hmm. if you don't, when that thing gets taken away from you, it's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah. So the, the, the way that I would try and explain this, and it's, it's hard because it goes a little bit into kind of deeper psychological kind of phraseology and terminology, but essentially being a professional athlete is an extrinsic event. I have no control over whether I'm a professional athlete because I can't decide to go and play for Tot- Hotspur, Manchester United, Real Madrid. You know, someone has to come along and go, we've seen what you do. We think we could give you this opportunity. And if you have the, the right potential, the right credentials, you know, then you might have an opportunity to go and play there. But that is not in your control. And if it's not in your control, then you have nothing to do with, with putting it in as part of your identity. So I was like, well, if I can't control this and if someone else can decide my future, that's not a really good position to be, you know. There's absolutely no diversity in that. So my identity started to become, oh, I'm, I'm a student. So I went and studied my, my degree while I was playing. Or I went and studied Italian. I started learning, you know, how to play the guitar, the piano. I started working as, a, as a, uh, a landlord, so a property investor. I started all these different things. So it gave me all these different yeah. identities that I could fall back on or yeah. at least have in my life. And out of those 10, 15 things, if suddenly one of them came away, like football, which was out of my control, I still left me with a whole life still to carry on with. And what I'm thinking about now, and I'm guessing you've read it, James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, Atomic Habits. and just how reinforcing identity and habits are. And like you said there, it is kind of almost a weird concept or something to wrap your mind around, like being a professional athlete is an extrinsic event. Like you're actually not in control of it because people are like, oh, but you worked so hard to get there. Yes, but ultimately you could be taken at a moment. And they did. Yeah. And Every single club yeah. I was at. I never stage took it away. And then who am I, right? And you had to make this choice to engage in other behaviors, to build habits that were going to help shape and form your identity outside of just that sport. And I think that's so important for us as coaches to do, but then also to encourage that in our athletes. And I, I think what you mentioned earlier is so true you know, I primarily am coaching 14 and 15 year old boys and their identity is totally wrapped up in sport. And I get it. You know, when I was a 14, 15 year old boy, mine was too, pretty much. And now as, as an adult, I see them do things, hear them say things and it kind of just breaks your heart. Like, oh man, like you think that because you're an athlete, you can't be X, Y, Z. Actually, I had a girl in class that uh, she was a basketball player. She was in my ninth grade English class and really bright girl, really sharp. She should have been in an advanced class and wasn't. And the reason she wasn't was really because she had this preconceived notion of what athletes were and that athletes you know, didn't like school. And we, you know, we were, they were doing an independent reading book and she, she found this book that she loved and she just devoured it. And I think I asked her something, like, you going to find another one or said something, in fact, uh, like she was telling me about it. And she was like, yeah, I mean, I just really have never read books before. And I was like, why? She's like, well, you know, I don't know. I'm just more of an athlete. Athletes don't really read books. And I was like, I coach, I read books. I was an athlete. I read books. Like, why? Like, why can't you be that? Why would you let some preconceived expectation from society dictate who you are and how you walk through life. And I think the exact same thing should be said for coaches there too. Why would you let the expectations and perceptions of what a coach is from society dictate how you coach? Oh, a coach is supposed to be loud, highly emotional, chew kids out for mistakes. So I've got to do that. No, that's, that's ludicrous. <laughs> you don't have to do what the societal message is about a coach or an athlete. Yeah. I- Listen, all of that is all part of the, the journey. You know, that's the, you're saying that now as a you know, kind of fully mature guy who, who can look at both sides of the coin and doesn't have to probably, well, you probably still do conform to social norms, but you don't do it as much and it's much more on your terms. But you can see how whenever you're really, really wrapped up in what other people think of you when you're younger. And so it's, we get that it's difficult. I think what the coaches 
I suppose, challenges. How do you share or how do you create an environment that allows people to go outside the norm? And it's funny, I just, I just give two quick stories whenever we were doing the session earlier. One was I started yoga when I was 17 and, you know, trying to bring my yoga mat into the first team dressing room at Norwich City was, you know, just a disaster because it got cut up, it got burnt, it got, you know, driven, driven over by the cars and the car park, literally everything until eventually I just kept doing it. I'm like, I'm so stubborn. There's no way I'm letting them beat me on this. I kept buying a new one, new one, new one until eventually they got bored of doing it. I carried on with my yoga. And then, of course, what happened? A couple of people start poking their head around the corner going, oh, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing some yoga, doing some stretching. But why are we going to go out and do some you know, warm-up stretches? And, and I was like, yeah, but I just want to be better before. I want to be feel more flexible before I actually do the warm-up. Until eventually another few months passed. What happened? Three or four of them started joining me every morning for the yoga. And I was like, going, well, you know, this is the way society progresses. You know, no one's done until someone does it the first time. They're going to get met with a volley of abuse until eventually people's going to start questioning them. Until people are just going to accept that that's the norm. That's just the way life is. It's happened over millennia. And it'll continue happening in every, you know, pocket of society. And then the other one was about trying visualization when I was a kid, just because my dad suggested it. And again, having a probably an open mindset and curiosity about how to improve and do things differently. And I started doing visualization and suddenly at the end of my career, 20 years later, the one scenario that I used to visualize, 50, 60% of the goals that I scored was that one scenario, which was getting the ball on the left-hand side, cutting into the edge of the 18-yard box and curling it in the far top corner. Now, is that down to the visualization I did? Well, academia will tell you the cause and effect, critical analysis, critical thinking. We can't say it was down to the visualization, but probably a better question would be is, was it a coincidence? Probably not. Yeah, uh, that's, that's so interesting. I want to hit on one more piece of that framework, emotions, and start with, you know, as, as coaches, we're performers too, and emotion, emotion can derail things really quickly. Or on the other side of that, emotion can be a tool if used wisely, I think, in the sporting context. So when you talk about emotional regulation, emotional control, what do coaches need to be thinking about when it comes to that? And really, how can we get better at it? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. The, uh, the first thing I, I try and get across is that there's no such thing as a bad emotion. So I'll give, uh, you know, like a, an example of whenever I, I'll just talk about it, getting released from clubs. So whenever I was 21, 2021, I was released from Tottenham Hotspur. And you can imagine being released from my first professional club, one of the biggest clubs in the country. I was devastated. You know, I thought my entire world was finished. I thought I was moving back home to Ireland. My career's over before it's even begun. Three games and I'm done. And I was devastated. So all of that, you know, devastation, you know, just soul searching, all of those emotions that are not nice emotions to experience, really, really struggling just even to go through the day without crying. But would you say that was a bad emotion? I would say it wasn't because it gave me the motivation, the fight, the determination for me to prove everyone at Spurs who didn't think I was capable of playing in the Premier League again. I wanted to prove them wrong and I wanted to prove all the coaches before that who thought it was too small and I want to prove to myself and the family and all of these. So actually all of those, what my, some people might call, you know, really harsh, terrible emotions were the driving force for me then going to Norwich City, doing everything I could to focus on being the best athlete I could so that eventually get established in the team and you start playing 40 games a season, scoring 10 goals a season, getting winning championships, playing in the Premier League and it all became of that not very nice experience but very, very helpful and beneficial emotion. I think that's a great point there of just, and I'm sure you could speak more on this with, with your academia, but there's so much power in just recognizing and accepting and naming the emotion we're experiencing. Like, it's okay to feel angry as a coach. 
or to feel fr- like whatever it is, the emotions that we all experience, it's fine to experience them. I think then the question is, and I'm sure one of the things that you're working with athletes and coaches on is what do you do with that emotion? Like, does that emotion, <laughs> does that emotion choose you or do you choose Dictate. the emotion? Dictate yeah. the word. Yeah. What? Yeah, Dictate exactly. Dictate your behaviors as a result of that emotion. Because that just slides into, you know, again, very, very simple. The, the most basic concept in biology or biology and psychology is cognitive behavioral therapy. So your thoughts will drive your emotions. It's really, really simple. And as soon as you accept that and own that, because it's generally most people get so riled up and fired up and get that emotional because of generally an extrinsic external event or what someone said or what someone's done or something's happened on the field. So it's always an external. So it's their emotions based on how they've thought. So really what they should be potentially considering in another way is what meaning are they given to what just happened? Are they given the meaning that because this has happened, I have to get fired up, I have to start shouting, I have to start screaming? Or does everyone respond in that way? No, everyone have a different response. So is that helpful? Probably not. What can I do or what meaning can I give to something that's happened so I can respond in another way? Yeah, I think that's just a great question for us to consider when, when we're feeling these emotions. You know, what... What meaning am I making out of it? And, and I think, too, even maybe to circle back to where we started, to, to be able to get curious and ask ourselves, what belief fuels this emotion? Because I think a lot of times, for myself, especially, you know, if, I'm, if I'm feeling a strong emotion, it's probably connected to some belief I have that I feel like is being confirmed or maybe is... Uh, being countered, right? I believe this thing, but it's not coming to fruition. But I think that, yeah, that's that connection there too. Of like, we've got to get curious about, man, wh- you know, why am I feeling this emotion? What's this belief that actually underpins this right here? That's it's quite a lot, though, isn't it? You know, that's the try and that's introspection. How how do you start to try and become more aware of who you are, what you do, why you do it, and also back to where we started and your beliefs and your belief system. Because essentially, and again, that's why the subject today, the power of beliefs, they are running your life, my life, our lives of every single area. So for instance, the relationships that you have in your life are dictated by your belief system of what you'll accept or not accept. The finances that you have are based on what you think is acceptable or not. The food and drink you put in your body is all based on your beliefs of what you should be doing. Because probably in someone in Asia, I put a different set of food and drinks in but because it's their belief system. So again, it dictates everything. And in my experience, not a lot of people are working on this to understand what beliefs they have, are they helpful, are they actually really hidden within them? Yeah, totally. Paul, one more question for you, and then a couple of rapid fire questions. Here's my question. Knowing what you know now, when you reflect on your playing experience as an athlete, Maybe what's the one area that as you reflect on your playing career, you think, man, I wish I would have, I wish I would have known this, practiced this, had this skill. What is it? <laughs> on the mental side. Of no, things. Oh, I was going to say, this, this, <laughs> yeah. is, this is a, I, I, my mind went straight to business acumen. That's terrible, isn't it? That's the way my world works now that, <laughs> you know, everything I'm doing now is, is to do work in the corporate world and, and the clients I have. and. And who you speak for. So starting earlier along that path would have been probably the, the one thing I would have liked. But I, I've got to say that to try and give both me credit as a player then and also now to allow me to, to look back on what I did and, and be proud and happy with it and, and not have regrets is that I'm, I'm not a big fan of them. I don't, I don't feel that you make bad choices or wrong choices, maybe wrong choices is a better phrase for that because I think we're all doing the best we can with the knowledge that we have at the time in your life. And if I made certain choices and I was not the most professional player in the world, but I definitely try to maximize my psychology and mental side of my game. But I also, I remember that I stopped 
drinking alcohol when I was 22 for I think two and a half years because I really want to try and establish myself. And I thought, well, going out at the weekend and taking a day to recover is not good for my performance. And I got to about 24 and, and I remember just thinking, it might be helping my performance, but I know that I'm not enjoying myself anywhere near as much in my life. So I'm going to decide to start drinking again and have my weekends and my social side. And it was almost like a conscious choice that I'm happy to forfeit whatever performance gains I might have got from not drinking alcohol so that I could go out for nights out with my friends, family, girlfriend, or whatever, so that I could then go and have the experiences, memories of, you know, the social side of, of life and all those fun times. And, and again, could I have carried on? Yeah, probably could have done. Might have got higher in the, in the football and ladder. Probably, possibly. Do I regret it? No, because I, I feel so blessed and fortunate to have had the life and career I've had. And, and you made the choices intentionally. And it was an intentional, conscious choice. So again, that's why I don't regret it. But, you know, I probably could be sitting here, you know, never having to work again because I might have gone up into a different league and playing, you know, for more Premier League clubs and more games. But I also realized that this is life and we're all trying our best to get through it. And so whenever I come out of it now, I only look back at football and just think, I'm so lucky, you know. I, I, I loved kicking a ball around in the streets of Belfast growing up in the 90s. And then some crazy guy goes, do you want us to pay you some money to come and do it over in a professional team? I was like, yep. And then I went over there for a couple of years and then I went, do you want us to come pay you a little bit more money to come and play in the Premier League? And I went, yes, please. And then you started going through your career and every time it's going, do you want to play a bit more? Do you want to, do you want to play in front of 50,000? Do you want to have all these benefits of playing? I'm like, yep, yep, yep. And then at the end of my career, 32 and for the last 12 years, and I speak to some of the biggest companies and brands in the world. And they're like, can we pay you to come in and talk about your experience of kicking a ball around? I'm like, yes, please. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, but I, I, I respect and admire just the ability, the ability to look back and be grateful, you know, just to recognize, man, like I'm grateful for the journey that I've been on oh. and, and where it's brought me. So, well, I've got three quick rapid fire questions. Would love to know the first thing that comes to your mind uh, about the work you do now uh, as a sports psychologist, or it can be the work you do in the corporate space. The first one is this. Uh, the most fun part of coaching is seeing people progress. Yeah, absolutely. That's it. I just, funny, I was listening to Ben Freakley earlier, um, and I did the session with him earlier as well. He had ego versus mastery environments. And the ego, you've been in too many environments where, yep, it's nice if someone's telling you that you're doing well, but actually you're only ever competing with yourself. And so having that, you can see that you're getting better and you can see that you're achieving and conversation we had at the start, suddenly you're having, you're in a conversation that five years ago you weren't even being thought of. And suddenly now these people are thinking about it. You're going, yeah, that's, that's progress. Yeah, I love it. I wish I would have known blank before my first coaching experience. And maybe, yeah, again, as well, it's a sports psychologist. A sports psychologist. Yeah. Um, I was probably living too much off my football and experiences as a sports psychologist, which is why I went and did my master's. Don't think it gave me a huge amount of, of knowledge to help me in sport, but more there's a, an external validation that I'm very consciously aware of that I definitely didn't do it just for me, but more for other people to give that nod. So I think that I had nowhere near enough life experience and people outside of football so that I could then bring all that back into sport. Yeah, that's really interesting. Appreciate you sharing that. And the last rapid fire question is, I know I'm successful as a coach when... Oh, that's a good question. Um, when someone phones me up, or messages me further down the road and said, that thing you said X amount of years ago has just come true. Or I've just made it happen for me in my life. And that's pretty special. It is. Special is a good word for it. Well, Paul, this has been fantastic. Before we hop off, just share with people where they can connect with you and learn more about the work that you do. Yeah, brilliant. So I think the, the best place is definitely on social media, whether it's uh, on LinkedIn, Twitter, Paul McVeigh 77, Instagram, Paul McVeigh 77. 
or on Facebook. I'm on there with loads of loads of coaches across the US. Or our program is is get psyched hyphen up dot com. Get psyched hyphen up dot com. And yeah, you can try it, see if whether it's it's for you and for your team and close because essentially we're doing it on a per person uh, basis. That if you have you know one to hundred players, then it's eighty nine dollars per per player. If you have over hundred players, up to five hundred drops down to fifty nine. And if you have over five hundred players, then it's thirty nine dollars for the entire program. You think well. That's almost like that's two pizzas for your entire psychological <laughs> development. Yeah. Or yeah. you can eat two pizzas. It's your choice. Yeah. Yeah. But if you get a, cl- a club of kids, <laughs> man, what a way to invest in them. Well, that's awesome. Paul, thanks so much for joining me. Coaches, thanks for listening to this episode. And thanks to Paul for joining me. As always, if you enjoyed this episode and you want to grab a copy of the free podcast notes, just go to cuttingedgecoach.com slash podcast or click the link in the show details. My practical takeaway from today's episode is a simple question for reflection. How much time are we spending on the mental side of the game with our athletes? It's a challenging one for me as well because the honest answer is not enough. So my challenge for all of us is just to start somewhere and start small. The only way we'll get better as coaches at teaching mental performance is if we start trying to grow in it ourselves and teach it to our players. So let's all start doing it. It doesn't have to be perfect, but just start doing it because I think we all recognize how much it matters. And hey, don't forget to check out summercoachingseries.com to learn more or get access to the 2022 Summer Coaching Series. That's summercoachingseries.com. Thanks for listening to the podcast.